It's a beautiful day, and I know you had a lot of things that you could have been doing this afternoon, but you chose to come here, and so we're very thankful. I'm Ken Tate. I'm the Director of External Relations uh, for the Department of Computer Science, and on behalf of the college and the Department of Computer Science, it's my honor to welcome you to this. This is the LabCorp Leadership in Technology Speaker Series, in case any of you are in the wrong place. So I was asked to make a couple of uh, announcements before we get started. If you're a grad student and you need to check in, uh, if you could wait until after the presentation, but this gentleman right there waving his hands can help you. And if you're with the Honors of Scholars program, there's a gentleman in the back waving his hands, and you can check in with him. So a couple more announcements. Now is a great time to silence cell phones, uh, anything that might serve as a distraction. Also let you know that we are videotaping. I should take time to say hello to everybody now that we're also streaming this live around the globe. Uh, we normally have pretty good uh, attendance, 50, 60 people or so that join us uh, virtually, but you're in the room, and so we're very, very glad for that. Uh, this is our 15th year. This is our final talk for the 22-23 academic year. We will be back for year 16. So this is like uh, our 90th talk. So um, we put this series on starting six, 15 years ago to give computer science students and students across campus some insight into this wonderful world of leadership in technology. And we cover different topics, everything from security to artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, you name it. This week, we're doing something really cool. We're gonna talk to an entrepreneur that's gonna tell us about his journey specifically in security and maybe some mistakes along the way, certainly some lessons learned, and I think you'll all walk away with um, a great deal of knowledge. All right, so as a matter of introduction, we are very, very happy to have with us today Erkong Zheng. Erkong, let me say a few words about you, Erkong, since your staff pre prepared these for me. Um, Erkong's the founder and CEO of one of our e-partners called Jupiter One. Uh, he's held practitioner and key leadership roles in a number of companies, though, before he started uh, Juniper One, including Life Omic, uh, Fidelity Investments, and IBM. It's kind of a homecoming um, for him. He's got both his bachelor's degree and his master's degree here from NC State in computer science. We're real happy about that. But he also holds five patents, multiple industry certifications, and is a regular speaker at conferences around the globe. And most importantly, he's a pretty new member of our Departmental Strategic Advisory Board. So we're very, very happy tonight to have with us Erkong Zheng. Erkong? Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Well, thank you for being here. Well, I think uh, most of you are students uh, at NC State. Is that right? Or by a show of hands, if you are a student here, please. Raise your hand. All right, so most of you are. Uh, if you are a graduate student, anybody? Oh, all right, we have almost half of them. That's awesome. Well, uh, this is my first time speaking at the uh, LabCorp series, so thank you, Ken, and NC State for inviting me. And like you said, right, so it very much is a homecoming for me, and I'm very excited to be here. And I, I uh, think back on my journey at NC State, it's, uh, almost 20 years ago, and uh, it's just been quite a journey in quite a while. And anything particular that will be helpful for any of you you want to hear, and um, I, I want to make this a bit interactive. I don't have a ton of slides. In fact, I only have two slides uh, to share with you and tell you about my story and my journey. And uh, anyone who has been part of the, the LabCorp uh, speaker series before, or this is not the first one, if by a show of hand. Oh, all right. So what, what are you looking forward to from today's session? How can I help you? What do you want to learn? Share your experience. You get a life experience because everybody has their own story. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, they all have their own challenges, obstacles, and the way how they solve it. So okay. share your experiences. Yeah. What, what major are you? Computer science? Computer science. Uh, doing supply chain security. So oh, supply chain security. 
it's a hot topic nowadays. Anybody else focus on cybersecurity, undergraduate or graduate? All right. What, what do you think about cybersecurity? No? No opinion? Anybody else who wants to share that what you want to learn today? Or how can I better help you? Oh, that's that's great. That's uh, that's a, that's a great uh, prompt. So I, I will I will share some of that, and in fact, it's not it's not all good. You know, a lot of uh, uh, interesting failures and lessons learned and battle scars, and that's actually what helped me to get me here. Somebody else, I, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, awesome. So how, how do we use technical skills to get there? And, and actually, that's a, that's a good one, because I'm, I'm a technical founder myself, right? So a lot of people uh, found companies because they have uh, business degrees or they have um, uh, business trainings and economics and things like that, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, let me, let me share those with you. So let me get into those. And uh, can everybody hear me OK? I've got like multiple mics here. And, and I hope that uh, you can hear me. If, if, if you can, then it's not my fault. All right. <laughs> so. All right. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about myself, uh, and then I'll get into some of the more interesting stuff. Uh, I was born in Beijing, and I grew up in uh, Guangzhou, China. Anybody know where, where that is, Guangzhou? Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah we have uh, people who are familiar with that. Yeah, so it's a place near Hong Kong. It's actually the third or maybe fourth largest city in China. And uh, I am in Cary, North Carolina right now. I've been here since 2000, almost uh, 23 years. And when I first uh, moved to the US, I was uh, in high school, and I was in uh, LA, California. And I was there for uh, a couple of years, and then uh, came over here to go to school in NC State. Uh, got my both my bachelor's and master's degree, both in computer science, from NC State. I have two kids, two boys, and um, the older one is at UPenn right now. He's in dental school, and um, he went to uh, Chapel Hill for his undergraduate. Don't hold that against him. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm still a big fan of the Wolfpack, as you can see. Right. So that was at the... Uh, basketball game uh, earlier this year, and a um, uh, pretty, pretty amazing game. I think we won against uh, Notre Dame. It was a good game. So don't tell Alex, my, my older son, don't tell him that, that uh, I, I think NC State is a better school. All right, so for sure. And why is that? Because uh, when I was in LA, I actually uh, was accepted to UCLA. And I decided to not go to UCLA and came to NC State. So I, I think that tells you a lot. Right? So, and I, I do think that uh, we have uh, one of the best computer science and engineering programs uh, in the nation. And I'm really excited to be on the advisory board. And it's my passion to help the department and help the, the university to uh, continue to improve, right? So be a better program for all of you, right? So, and for uh, you know, the, the future generation of talents and, and leaders. So here's a couple of things I, I like to do. Um, I'm not very athletic, and um, the only sport about all of the things that I do enjoy is skiing in the winter. So I can uh, only work out like five days the whole year. So I should probably do better. And uh, I do like fast cars. Uh, that was me in Vegas earlier this year. I was at a racetrack. Uh, it was a company event. Um, it was the Lamborghini I drove, and that's not mine. I wish I had one. And at some point, you know, maybe I would. And after Jupiter One exits, maybe I will see. And that's uh, me and my younger son uh, Adam at uh, uh, at skiing earlier this year. Uh, I do love fishing. I not fishing in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, bass tub that I have, right? So with with the koi, uh, and I do keep fish at home. 
I'll tell you the story there. It was actually kind of kind of interesting. Uh, I I had a very large fish tank. Moved to a new place uh, a couple of years ago. Had a very large 200 gallon fish tank. I put a bunch of fish in there. Well, actually, not not many. Four fish. And they all grew so big, and they started not liking each other. <laughs> and uh, they tried to jump out. And in fact, one of them did jump out like four times. And I had to rescue him and put him back. It was uh, very hectic every time, right? So, and I need to dig a koi pond in my yard, but just uh, never had time, right? So this is part of the entrepreneur and, and founder life. And, and I'll be sharing with you a little bit about you will not have any time for anything else. So if that's what you want to do, be prepared. Okay, and so I ended up relocating them temporarily, temporarily to my bathtub, and that was six months ago. So I'm still trying to figure out how to uh, deal with the fish situation. Well, the, uh, the couple of things that I want to share as learnings throughout my, my journey, right? So whether it's uh, personal or professional or uh, schools and, and all of that, uh, it really summarizes into two words. One is reflection. Do a lot of reflections. So think about what you wanted to do, what are your goals, and how do you get there? And also just look back on the things that you have accomplished and see how far that moved the needle forward. And what do you have to change to get better every day? So all you have to do is just be 1% better every day. And the second one is reinvent yourself. So um, it, it comes with you know, a couple of things, right? So one, you know, with the reflection is the, the, the self-awareness, the self-learning, and the continuous improvement. And the reinventing yourself is, all, is also uh, getting out of your comfort zone and doing something that other people wouldn't expect you to do, right? So for example, giving up on UCLA and coming to NC State, um, my mother, who happened to be here today, she's visiting from California, and, uh, and she was like, you're crazy. Why would you do that? And she actually had already paid for the, the uh, admissions fee and, and all of that, and I was like, well, you know what, it's okay. It's okay, NC State is a better school. I tried to convince her, and, and she, she, she got it now. So look, you know, here's where I am, right? So there's some, this is the proof that NC State can be and better than UCLA. So doing something unexpected. And some, something else that I'll share with you, I'll let you in on a, on a secret. Uh, when I was at NC State and doing my undergraduate uh, study, I love that NC State, NC State has this BS, MS, combined program. Anybody in that program? Okay, great. Well, I hope you like it, yeah? It does help accelerate things, right? So I feel like my whole life, my whole career, I've, I've just been very impatient. I, I wanted to just, just get things done as quickly as possible. Not that I wanted to, to get away from NC State, I, I, I love it here, but um, at that point of my journey, I, I just felt like, oh, I, I, I want to be done with school. Okay, I wanted to graduate uh, as, as quickly, as early as possible. So there was one semester, so I, I figured out that it was my last semester, supposedly my uh, second last semester. I was like, well, you know, I wanted to graduate this semester, and uh, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And um, so I took a lot of classes. So I figured out a way to um, book and schedule as many classes as physically possible that would fit into my schedule. Anybody, anybody want to take a guess how many credit hours that I took in my last semester before I graduated, um, get my uh, um, undergraduate degree? Any guess? 20. 20. All right. Any, any other guesses? I think that's probably an unofficial record. I can't prove it, but I, I think it is. 
And uh, because I, I knew nobody had, else had done it before, I, I hope nobody else has done it because I do not recommend it. All right, so I, I took 31. All right, 31. And I, I think, I, think I, I started with 32, and then, you know, uh, halfway into it, I was like, ah, oh, this is a little too much. So I dropped uh, like a one, one credit hour class. So, so 31. And that includes, keep in mind, I was in the BSMS combined program, so that includes three classes, so nine, nine units of graduate level classes. So there are two, two reasons I did it. One was that, like I said, right, I was sort of impatient. And, uh, and second, was actually a good financial reason. I don't know if the school still uh, does this. I feel like it, it was a loophole. And after, after 18 credit hours, it's all the same cost. Is this still the case? Yes. All right. <laughs> so there you go. I was like, wow, the ROI. Right? Think about ROI, the return on investment. That was huge. So if I could have done 36, I probably would have done 36, but there was just physically no time in the day. So how did, how did, how did that ever actually happen? And people ask me the question, how did it actually happen? And um, it, it, it wasn't easy. It, it wasn't easy to get that uh, approved to begin with. And I, I talked to folks and you know, the admission or the registration office was like, uh, I don't think the system will let you do that. We, we, can't, we can't actually do it. So I ended up going to, to the dean. I, I talked to the dean. And I think they had some, some meetings about it. And uh, uh, he personally approved it. Uh, it was 20 years ago. That's not the same dean. Don't, don't go to him. He's probably, Greg is probably not going to uh, approve anything for you. <laughs> so all right, so, th so that was that, right? So and again, you know, everything has a trade-off. That's another thing that you want to think about, right? So I chose to go through school as quickly as possible and do all of those things, including things like you know, taking 31 credit hours of classes, but it's not without cost. I missed out on a lot of things, right? So I actually missed out on uh, making lots of friends and the college life and all of those. So you know, when you're making choices, you also have to think about the trade-off, right? So is that uh, really what you wanted to do? So I have a little bit of regret doing that, right? So at the end of the day, you know, graduating a semester later, big deal, you know? So, uh, right, that's, uh, that's on, the, on my personal journey so far. And let me get to my career and share some other stories. Anybody has heard of Jupiter One before today? Two, three, all right, well, it's not too bad. All right, well, hopefully uh, uh, next time I, I show up here, there will be more than three hands, and you know, that means we'll be a, a little bit bigger, a little bit better. So uh, Jupiter One, I started roughly three years ago, uh, and in three years, uh, we went from uh, 16 people to now about 160 people, right? So for some of you who uh, may have heard of Jupiter One, and we are a VC-backed uh, startup in the cybersecurity software as a service space. And uh, just in the short two and a half years, uh, I went through about three rounds of uh, venture capital funding and if you're familiar with that, that's just getting investors to uh, listen to your pitch. And then after about a thousand pitches, and some of them will say, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we'll jump in. And then we figure out you know, how, much, how much you want to, well, this is how it goes, right? So with the, the VCs, right? So I, and keep in mind, this is VCs on the, on the West Coast. So I started Jupiter One uh, in the first year of fundraising roughly in uh, 2000, 2020, and that was right after COVID. So uh, it was actually, to me, it was a bit of a blessing in disguise because uh, you know having those uh, 50 plus is not a thousand, but you know, but more than 50 uh, investors and talking to those VC firms, and some of those were multiple conversations. So it really, is you know more than 100 conversations, and the majority of them, 99% of them, are on the West Coast. They're during the Bay Area, and uh, 
you know, luckily I didn't have to travel all the time back and forth to the Bay Area during that time period. Otherwise, it would have been imp impossible. And I, I got the investors to uh, hand me tens of millions of dollars without uh, meeting me in person. Well, that was actually pretty crazy, now thinking about it. And they said it too, it was like, oh, I can't believe we just handed you those checks without ever seeing you. All right, so anyway, so it feels like from the outside, right, so there's a lot of success and there's a lot of excitement, but I'll, I'll share with you some of the, um, you know, things that you may not see from, uh, from the outside. And, and those are the more important lessons, and those are what, you know, helps me and, and hopefully uh, all of you to be successful uh, in the future. Now, we have raised a total of about $120 million, and the last round was at over a billion dollars of valuation of the company, whatever that means, right? So the stock market is not doing so well, so I don't want to think about it too much. But that, that, were, that was the numbers last year. So the reality is this, right? Anybody seen this photo? You have? Yeah, that is the reality. The reality is uh, it, it looks kind of like that from the outside, but more often than not, I, me, my team, and, and Amy on my team is here today as well. And more, of, more often than not, we are in the valleys. You know, there are days that uh, we, we feel like, oh my God, everything's falling apart, and this is not working. You know, everything I'm doing is, is not good enough and not right. There are many of those days. But let me tell you the, the whole story, the, the entire journey. So going back to uh, graduating from NC State. So I graduated from NC State. I think I got my undergraduate in 2002 or 2003. I, I forgot. It's, it's been a while. And I, I uh, actually didn't think that I was going to stay in North Carolina for, for that long. I've been looking for a job and uh, figuring out what to do and um, uh, ended up uh, working at Cisco. So long story short, and did engineering and quality assurance and QA work. So I was there for uh, a couple of years. And, and then a, a group of us, we decided to spin out. Oh, not, well, actually not spin out, just, just to get out of Cisco and, and do something uh, different. So this is uh, in about 2004. And we started this company called uh, Stonewall Networks, right? So I'll, I'm going to skip the other one. Uh, Stonewall Networks, and uh, so it's about 10, 15 people who came out and said, hey, let's start this uh, company uh, outside. And that was my first startup experience. Okay, so I was not a co-founder, uh, I was an engineer, but you know, part of the original founding team at this company called Stonewall Networks. You know, very small, we did the network management software, and uh, it was sort of what I did at uh, NC State, right? So I did my research uh, at NC State with uh, Dr. Volk. He's still here, right? So some of you may, may have uh, heard the name. And he's great, I uh, love the guy. And he, he, he was my advisor at NC State, and we did the, uh, a network anom anomaly detection system, which I think was uh, used by NC State's CIO office for network security for a while after uh, you know, we were done with the project. And sort of like a sidebar story, so all of these are startup related, right? So he and I, years later, years later, so uh, Dr. Volk and I would catch up and we'll be talking about that project and uh, you know, we would jokingly say that, oh man, we should have done something about that. Because the only other company that did, that had the similar technology, was a company called um, Lancope at the time. And then uh, in 2015, Lancope got acquired by Cisco for $475 million. So really should have done something about that. <laughs> that would have been a great first startup experience. But back to Stonewall Networks, that actually was not a great first startup experience. So that was the first time I got laid off from a job, and um, which actually was, was not bad, right? I mean, I, you know, you're into it, and I got laid off, and actually gave me some time to finish my you know, graduate thesis. 
and did a bunch of uh, uh, certifications and, and all that, uh, given the free time that I had. And two months later, they got a little better. They asked me back. So I came back and rejoined them. So we started this thing, and uh, it, it was the first lesson learned. I did not realize that at the time. Uh, it was just so hard, right? So the, the product is very hard to sell, and it just seems like it was very hard to raise money. And of course, the timing was terrible. And the technology, we feel like, man, we have, we have some great technology there. Why wasn't anybody buying? And also, it was so hard to raise money. I remember raising less than $2 million from a uh, West Coast venture capital firm. It was almost impossible. It took month and month and month to back and forth to finally get that you know, 1.5 something million dollars it was so hard. And that was the first time I learned about product market fit. Okay, so for all of you that may think about uh, starting your own thing, your own business, or building your own product, that is super important. The product market fit, timing. Timing is everything. And sometimes you feel like, wow, the, I have this great, amazing idea Many people have ideas. Ideas are actually fairly cheap. And in order to execute it is what's hard. And timing is super important. If you're too early, not going to work. If you're too late, somebody else would have done it already. So that, that is very, very difficult to get right. Well, at the end of the day, that company didn't work out. And um, they still owe me about six months of pay to this date. But it's all right. So I think that's just tuition for some great lessons learned. I had a great time, um, get to know a lot of good people, and still had fun. You know, my, my wife was, you know, asking me, you know, why, why are you still doing this? You know, I was working for free for a month. And she was like, you know, why are you doing this? Well, we were just having fun. It was re really a lot of fun. So it, we, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. So from uh, Stonewall Networks, I, I went on to a couple of other uh, small companies. They are both local in, in Raleigh. And uh, Refence Network Technology and uh, P4 Performance Management, both are local. They're actually the, the same company. Refence was acquired by P4 uh, right before I joined, so I ended up being the, the CTO for, for both of those companies. And um, in parallel, right, so I, I started talking to some other local founders uh, that started a company called Magnus, Magnus Health. Anybody heard of that company, Magnus Health? No? So what they, what they did was a um, electronic medical records software, EMR. Right? So, I mean, if you go see a doctor today, right? So it, I mean, years, years before, it was all, all paper. Right, but now it's all electronic, right? So the, the big names are the uh, Epic and the Cerner and, and all of those, right? They have this massive network of uh, electronic medical records. Uh, you know, UNC Health System, Wake, and they, they all have, they all use something like that. Now, it was a, a, a small company trying to do similar things, but uh, ended up having to pivot because it's, it was very hard to compete with uh, the larger uh, platforms. So uh, we then shifted the focus to student medical records. And that was actually a, a pretty good pivot. And focus on boarding schools and private schools and varsity sports teams and you know, handling medical records for students uh, and you know, those transactions and building a mobile app and, and so on, right? And then years later, it was years later when my uh, younger son Adam is going to school. He started at uh, Care Academy. And um, we're doing some uh, prerequisite and you know, paperwork and all of that. And then I got this invite in the email. It says, hey, complete your, submit your uh, medical records through Magnus. Just download this app. And I was like, oh, I know that. You know, I built that thing years ago. Right? So it was actually uh, pretty cool to see something that I built uh, originally uh, get actually being used uh, year, years later. Well, 
Um, at the same time, I was actually not full time at Magnus, right? So Magnus later on um, was bought by a private equity firm. They exited. It wasn't a big deal, but it was a, a successful run for the company. And uh, I was sort of part time there, and I was uh, a little bit gun shy of getting back into a startup, right? So after just a failed experiences and still, you know, pretty poor, you know, not able to make any money from the experiences I had before. So I ended up at IBM. And uh, that, was, that was when my mom, she's here, and that's when she got the most excited out of all of these things, right, that I did, she was the most excited. Oh, IBM, that's awesome. I have heard of that company. <laughs> it's great, it's great. It's, yeah, it is great. So I, I was there for almost eight years. And, you know, and eight years, and now looking back, it depends on who you talk to, right? So if you talk to someone and you, you tell them you've been at, uh, you were at IBM for eight years, and they were like, oh, IBM, what, what's wrong with you? Like, what happened? Right, because they, they look at, you know, hey, you, you, you're supposed to be a builder, entrepreneur. Why were you at IBM for eight years? That doesn't make sense, right? But then uh, there's, there's some truth to, to uh, both of that, right? So. There were a lot of uh, mediocre people at IBM. You know, that, that is the, the truth, because lar large companies, right? So when you get to that size, that's just the way it works. Um, but then on the flip side, I really loved the experience at IBM. I was there for eight years. And in, the, in those eight years, I took four different jobs at uh, IBM every, every two years. So this goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier is uh, reinventing yourself, right? So getting out of your comfort zone. So all of those things I, I've been doing, right? Every time, you know, I feel like I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone in some way, including taking 31 credit hours of classes, and you know, that was quite a bit outside my comfort zone. And, uh, you know, doing a startup, you know, from Cisco, doing a startup, never done that before. You know, getting laid off and coming back, right? So a lot of those are outside of my comfort zone. And then going to IBM was probably one of my biggest learning experiences in, in, in my career, you know, helped me uh, to become who I am. And sometimes, you know, people, you may feel like, wow, well, if I need to do a startup, I should start early, you know, think about uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and all of those people, right? So who were, you know, college drop-offs uh, and dropouts, and then started their, their thing and became so successful. Doesn't happen that way. You know, the 99.99% of cases, it just doesn't happen that way. And I feel like all of these things really help prepare me a lot better than a typical founder uh, would have experienced. And I'll, I'll get to that more. So getting back to IBM, you know, why, why was that? important to me and, and what's the outside of the, the comfort zone that um, uh, story for me. I'm very much an introvert myself, right? I don't know if you could tell, but, uh, and I did not like public speaking. I did not like, you know, uh, doing all of those things. I was very much an engineer, right? So that's what I did up to that point of, of my career, right? Even that as CTOs, I mean, it feels like big titles, but you know, I was basically a team of one or two or three very small teams and, you know, still uh, very much in the weeds, writing software and building products and, and all of those, right? So I decided to go to IBM as a consultant and never done that before. And it forces me to just go out and talk to people. Now, that's what consultants do, right? You just show up and you talk to people and tell people what to do and then you leave and good luck. Right. So it actually was a little bit more than that. We, we did uh, better than just show up with uh, some pieces of papers and left behind and, and, and not care. Uh, but that was you know, one of my getting out of the, of the comfort zone uh, experience. Right. So I, I was uh, sort of forced myself to go on the road uh, interact with customers and do projects. And I was on the road so much. And for the first few years of IBM, uh, I was traveling probably uh, 45, 50 weeks out of the whole year. 
and uh, was out Sunday through Friday and just be at the, a customer site and doing projects and uh, you know talking to the, the management teams and you know providing you know ideas and uh, and guidance and, and so on and so forth. Now, now after that, right? So after being a consultant for for a couple of years, uh, I ended up leading a number of global practices uh, at IBM, right? So long story short, I ended up leading the data security practice, the uh, emergency incident response practice that was part of IBM security services. And, uh, and also a lot of the audit, consulting, assessment practices. And there was a lot of really, really cool, uh, interesting stories uh, you know, during, during those journeys. And I remember there was uh, one incident that we had. It was some oil and gas company in the Middle East. And they were attacked by some uh, malware, ransomware, or something like that. And they were literally minutes away from just shutting the whole thing down and being disconnected. Just pull the plug, disconnect from the internet, minutes away. And until they called my team at IBM at the time, and, and this was a country that was not easy to get to. You have to go through visas and all those processes. And um, we ended up flying people over to the neighboring country without a visa and have some people escort the team on foot to cross the country to go in there and help these guys fix the issues. And things like that were literally things that you kind of see in the movies, right? So it was really, really cool experiences um, at IBM. So. After a few years there, and uh, I moved from running the actual practices to product management, product marketing, and being more on the business side of uh, IBM security and the services. And all of those are very different experiences I have ac accumulated, which I believe really helped me get to, again, the point that uh, where I am today. And um, at one point, right, so eight years later, I feel like, well, it's about time for me to figure something else out. And then I uh, found this opportunity at Fidelity, uh, ended up joining. So when I interviewed at Fidelity, it was actually kind of funny. And I, uh, it was the uh, senior VP of quality assurance that are hiring a uh, head of information security. So I remember, sitting in the room and having a couple conversations and afterwards and everything was great. And, uh, you know, and we're talking about offers and he decided to let me join. And then I asked him this question and, and I said, why do you need me? I mean, you're Fidelity. You have hundreds, hundreds of security people. What am I gonna do there? And you know, what is this head of software security gonna do? And how many people are, are on the team? She says, well, just you. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, well, trust me, just, just come in, come in. We're like rebuilding this. You're going to build a whole new team and all of those. And mm, I would just feel like some, something doesn't quite feel right. But I still joined. All right. And, and I, I remember uh, you know, when, I, when I told my mom that, uh, oh, I'm leaving IBM and going to Fidelity. And she, she was like, oh, you're, you're crazy. Why, why are you leaving IBM? IBM's so great. What is Fidelity? Well, then, of course, I, I had to educate her and say, well, Fidelity is, you know, this, not, even though it's not a public company, it's this big, great, you know, financial institution, and it's got all these things going on, billions and trillions, I, I forgot the exact number, trillions of dollars under asset under management. All right, and that made her feel better. Okay, so. Uh, Fidelity, what happened there? So Fidelity is a, a very interesting organization. They have multiple companies uh, as part of the, uh, the, the business, the entire enterprise. And one of the, the business unit is the retail uh, B2C, right? So the consumer facing business, all of the stock transactions and the uh, branches that you see um, 
uh, out on the uh, on Page Road and, and all of those, right? So it's part of that business unit. And that business unit was going through a major digital transformation. Right? You may have heard that term, digital transformation, you know, going through uh, changing from waterfall, monolithic uh, development methodologies to agile DevOps, and then adopting cloud and, and all of those cutting edge, you know, amazing things. And by the way, all of those things that if you haven't been exposed to, you definitely should, right? So cloud computing, AWS, and Google, and Azure, and, and all of those things, right? So the enterprise side was not able to keep up on the security requirements, and they were not able to enable the business, empower the business to move at the speed that the business need, needed to move. So the leaders, the CIOs, and the uh, SVPs in that business unit wanted somebody to be within that uh, organization to build security from within and to help speed things up. So that was exactly what I did. And uh, in two years, two and a half years I was there, I went from just the only person starting that team to building a 45, 50 people team in two years. And uh, my five patents were from Fidelity yeah, during that time. So uh, by the time I was leaving, I ended up making a ton of friends. And uh, two of them actually ended up on my team today at Jupiter One. So they were both senior leaders at Fidelity at the time. So I feel actually really grateful for um, that period of time of getting to know those folks and getting to, to work together with them. So now, uh, the, what, what, what I ended up building was a lot of the internal automation. So there, there's a couple of things that I also wanted to, to share, right? So it feels like you know, my journey has been in these kind of two-year uh, chunks, right? So that is kind of by design. And, um, and every time I go into a job, and I, I didn't realize this until much later as well, and every time I go into something, uh, I go in with the mindset of, I'm going to work myself out of this job. Okay, so maybe not before I was, you know, had the first job and getting laid off and all of those, right? So, but since starting in dif different leadership roles, and that was my mentality. So a lot of leaders, they feel like they needed control, right? They, need, they needed to build a team, they needed to do whatever so that they can feel control of their own destiny. I, I think that's the wrong way of leading. And the right way of leading is that you've built out a strong team and organization and processes and all of those that whether you are not there, if you are there or not there, it shouldn't matter. So that's been the mentality I have, right? So everywhere I go, I sort of give myself a couple years to uh, transform things into a way that, you know, I could end up doing something else, something maybe bigger, greater. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't need necessarily to be there anymore to work myself out of a job. So how do I do that? How do you work yourself out of a job? Right? Not that, think about this, right? So I, I am not suggesting that you get laid off every two years. All right? So that wouldn't be good. Now, so two things that I think is important. One is automation. Everything, the whole world is, is software defined now, right? So, you know, most of you here are uh, engineering major, computer science major. So leverage that, leverage automation to take care of the mundane, day-to-day, -day boring stuff and the repeated work. If you have to do the same work more than two or three times, well, maybe it's time to automate that. And that's one. And two is that uh, always hire people who are better than yourselves. Right? So at, at some point, you're going to be in a leadership role. Right? So I, I hope you 
remember that, right? So a lot of leaders feel like that, uh, you know, hiring people better than themselves feels like a threat, right? Again, Amy's here. Amy's my uh, head of people, and she's definitely a lot better than me in people management and culture and people operations and those things. Always hire people better than yourself, right? They will help elevate you to the next level. But I would also give myself two years to learn everything from them. It's, it's a bit of a push and pull, right? So this challenge is, is always there. And I would always challenge them to continue to level up because, hey, if they stay still and two years later, I know everything that they know now, then I'm going to, again, being impatient, as impatient as I am, then it's not going to work anymore, right? So those two things, automate the processes and the little things and um, have people better than yourself around you. And now you may think, well, I'm not the leader, I'm not a manager, I'm not going to hire anybody. But it doesn't change the fact that those still apply. And have people better than yourself around you, even as peers. right? So that's, that's also very important. And you can still automate. Automate the work that you are responsible to, uh, to, for doing, and you can still transform yourself into doing that. So those principles and those practices still apply. All right, now moving on to almost the end of it, uh, and Lyphomic and Jupiter One. So those are actually quite closely related. So I was having the, the time of my, my life at Fidelity, right? So the team's great and you know, love the company, the company is awesome, care about their uh, associates and employees, and um, started having some conversation with this startup, uh, not in the area, an Indiana-based startup called Iphomic, and they, they said, hey, we're, we're looking for a uh, head of security, and, uh, you know, can you help us? And at the time, they had eight people. It was a very, very early stage startup. And... If I would join, I would be employee number nine, and again, would be by myself, one person, heading security, being the chief information security officer of a team of one. Right, so I, I, I really struggled. That was, a, that was the time I kind of probably struggled the most in all of my career decisions, right? Not only do I have to give up this great opportunity with significant compensation at Fidelity, I have to walk away from my team. That was hard. Okay, so, you know, yes, I, I, I just said that, you know, I, I worked myself out of the job, but still, you know, leaving your team behind, you know, after a couple of years of building it up was very, very hard. And uh, it was also super risky, right, super risky to go from a stable job to uh, a startup again, and I just remember the startup experiences I had in the, in the past and, you know, people still owe me money and all of those things. And, um, but I decided to do it because I, I was like, well, you know, after a few years at Fidelity, I feel like, you know, if I, the longer I stay there, the longer I'll probably be a forever Fidelity associate. Nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, if I wanted to do, jump back into doing a startup again, then that was the time. If I didn't do it, it was almost like a now or never moment. Uh, and then, of course, you might have guessed when I told my mom, what did she say? You're crazy. Fidelity, such a good job, you know? Why, why would you do that? And you go where? And the startup again? With how many people? And it just doesn't make any sense, right? So that was another one of my experiences of just doing things that are a bit unpredictable or unexpected. Uh, and, but there was a reason. There was a very specific reason I did it. So I had a, a conversation with the, um, the founder of uh, Lifeomic, who was a very, very successful uh, entrepreneur, had multiple IPOs before and successful exits. The last company he sold, he sold for $1.3 billion after IPO, and uh, he started this. He was a MD who never practiced uh, medicine and went into uh, software development. 
And so I said, look, you know, I'm going to give up a lot, right? But, you know, if we can, I can help you build security, but if we can maybe figure out taking that to the market, and think about this, right? So it's a win-win. You know, the, the money that you would have spent on security, make it an investment, and let's, let's you know, try to make this a win-win. So that's how I ended up at, at Lifeomic, started building a team, and, you know, built Jupyter One internally at the time. And uh, roughly a year later, right, so after building Jupyter One, decided to spin it out. So look, everyone's startup journey is different, right? So I, I, I point back to, to this slide right here, right? Everyone's journey is different. And this particular one of joining a company and then uh, spinning out at the end, I, also, I would also say, just like when I did 31 credit hours, I probably would not recommend it. Okay, so it was a big lesson learned. Why would I not recommend it? 90% uh, more than 90% of the spin outs uh, were not successful. It was very hard because instead of a two party agreement between the founders and investors, it became infinitely more complex with a three party everybody have to agree on the structure on the how does the uh, capitalization table works and all of those things and who gets what how much money and it just it was it was a big mess and i remember those days were uh, almost like a, a an episode in silicon valley right? if you've seen the show and it was those up and downs uh, it was not pretty uh, exactly so but here I am, right? So uh, three years, that was three years ago. And uh, since that time, I've had tremendous growth. And thanks to uh, the, my team and customers and all the great people I have around me and all of the success I had uh, was not because of me. It was because of all the people I had around me. And going back to uh, founding a company, there are, again, there are multiple ways of doing it, right? So you could go start a company right after school. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's just a lot of, uh, you know, up and uh, pros and cons that you have to think through. And one of those, right, so one of the, the benefits I had of starting a company later was all of those things before. Right, so all of those experiences, including failed startup experiences, failed fundraising experiences, failed product experiences, and all of the other success, right? Successful managing practices, managing people, and uh, you know, managing uh, product and marketing and all of those experiences. To me, that was really helpful in continuing to build and scale Jupyter One uh, to the next level. It is still very hard, very hard. Um, you know, every day I'm still learning uh, a lot from my experiences. Uh, there's, it's, it's never a dull moment, right? So everything is, every, every day is different. So here's where we are. And now I'll, I'll leave you with this. Uh, this is the J1 team. And we had a lot of fun. And we uh, go to different events and with uh, 160 something people all over the place. And we have, Oh, these are some of these things that uh, I would never imagine would happen as I would have never th thought about as a startup. We actually, as small as we are, we actually have employees in 33 states. That's incredible. And of course, that drives my uh, people department crazy. It's like all of the overhead. But 33 states. And uh, we actually just started our UK office. We have five people there now. We're officially international and starting uh, setting up the international entity as we speak. So it's really cool to see the growth and all the teams. And the one thing I would wrap up on is uh, this quote uh, I loved and I put it on the website uh, behind my picture as the intro. It always seems impossible until it is done. Any questions? 
Yeah. Uh, you, that's, that's a kind of tricky question, right? So how, how do you know, when do you know that, that you're ready to leave, right? Or move on to something else, right? So, and again, like, like I said, right? So work yourself out of a job. Um, don't take it too literally, right? So it just means that you're ready for the next challenge. It doesn't mean that you have to change company necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to change the job itself necessarily. Like right now, right, so I've, I've been the founder and CEO of Jupiter One for almost three years. I think I'm gonna keep doing this job for as long as I can see, right? But the reason is that Jupiter One is very different today than two years ago. And it's also very different today than even six months ago. So, but that's unique to a startup, right? Because you're growing so fast, it's unique to a startup. So back to your question, how do you know? Uh, you would know if you're getting bored, if you're not getting challenged enough, right? So first it starts with you challenging yourself. If you have a point that you feel like you are, you know everything about what you're doing every day, right? And if you feel like you're, you're getting comfortable with all of the things that you're doing, it's predictable of what's gonna happen today and tomorrow and next week, then, that, then that's about time. Right? You think about the next challenge. Yeah, well, you first, I think, yeah. Wow, uh, the, these are, <laughs> you're not making this easy. The, the one biggest regret, um, personally, professionally, both, okay, all right. I'll share the fun one, the per personal regret. Uh, and I, I used to play piano, and uh, my actual one biggest personal regret was actually not keeping that up, right? So. Uh, so that was, that was, that was there's, there's that. And professionally, I, I wouldn't say regret necessarily. I think it's just learnings, right? So one uh, biggest learning that I've had recently um, was that you, this is, may not be relatable until later in your career, right? So but for me, the biggest learning was uh, making tough decisions fast. And for me, the tough decisions are uh, having the right people in the organization, on the team, right? So I've, I've been on the side of being laid off. It didn't feel great. You know, I, I, I should say, I, I wanted to say it wasn't my fault. I mean, I, I believe it wasn't my fault. But uh, as sometimes now on the other side of the table, and there were sometimes difficult things that we had to do, for you know, whatever reasons, the reasons may not be the best reason for that individual. It certainly wasn't the best reason for the individual because you know, somebody's getting laid off or uh, let go for whatever reason. But for me and for the rest of the team and, and the company, those were good reasons. And the learning was, could have done it faster, sooner, and maybe a bit more. Right? So that was, that was a tough lesson. Oh, okay. All right, we got so many hands. Well, I'll, I can we'll, I can stay we'll around. Address, yes. Yeah, we'll address the extra ones. There's one more for the video. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, you, you. Go ahead. Well, yeah, all right. Uh, We're going to dig a quarter pond. You don't, have, you don't have much time, right? Yeah. Um, you going to help? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. That's, that's also a, a tough question. So uh, I, I think that I, I honestly, I don't spend enough time with uh, 
with with my family, right? So with my kids, my wife, and, and all of those, uh, I should, right? It's, it's just it's very hard. And, you know, I know that it says, you know, work-life balance, right? So you should definitely find work-life balance. But the reality is uh, being a founder, it's just very difficult to do, right? So I think I need to continue to uh, find more time to spend with, you know, my, my kids. And they're, they're both older now, so it's a little bit better. And even if I wanted to spend time with my teenage boy, he may not like it. So, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, it, it, is, it is a tough reality. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erkan. All right. So I hate to cut that short because I know you've got other folks that want to ask oh, no uh, questions. Um, you're going to be kind enough to stick around and maybe yeah, talk I'll, to I'll some stick students. Around. So yeah. good. So those of you that have questions, uh, I just want to say thank you again for coming. If you need a form signed, I will be around for that. We invite you to come back uh, in the fall for those of you who are not graduating because we'll do this all again then. Thank you so much. Yeah.